Hi, I'm David Greenbaum, one of the reference librarians at Clayton State. Welcome to the special social distancing video version of my library research and information literacy session. I've broken what would be a single in-class session into five shorter videos. This is the fourth in the series, and today I'm going to talk to you about critically evaluating the information sources you find. In other videos in this series, I talk about different search strategies you can use while searching library tools. I talk about different kinds of information sources and which tools you can use to locate them. We take a live look at the library homepage and conduct searches using those tools. And finally, I discuss how and why to cite your sources and avoid plagiarism. So this section deals with how you make decisions about the sources you've found once you've found them. In this day and age, we're all pretty much aware that some sources of information are better than others, and that you need to critically examine and evaluate any unfamiliar source to make some kind of informed decision about how appropriate, reliable, or useful it might be. One method for conducting this examination is called the crap test. And it's basically a series of questions you can ask yourself about a source to determine whether it's crap or not. CRAP is an acronym for five things you're questioning about the source. It's currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. C is for currency, and what you want to know is, when was this article, web page, or whatever it is, published? Is it still accurate and up to date? Has it been revised or updated since its first publication? Look for copyright or publication dates, dates of revision or update. Look also for date references within the text. If it says something like, in the past few years, that's less helpful than if it says, from 2017 to 2019. Dates are often easier to figure out for print materials than for some online sources since it's easy to change things online without noting when or whether a change was made. Some pages online are generated dynamically the moment you browse to them. Others may have been created in 2006 and left untouched since then. One thing you can look at on the web is whether any links out from the page are still functional. If it's linking out to pages that no longer exist, that's a clue that the page may not have been maintained as diligently or recently. It's also worth considering whether the topic you're dealing with strictly requires the latest, most up-to-date information, or whether older information is relevant to you. In scientific and technical fields, usually newer developments or discoveries supplant prior ones, whereas in the humanities, it's a lot more common for new scholarship to supplement what came before, rather than replacing it. The R stands for relevance. Or basically, how well does this answer the question you're actually asking? Sometimes you'll find an amazing resource that is interesting, authoritative, informative, and all that, but just a bit off target for your research project. If you're just starting out, sometimes you can refocus your project to be able to include this great source. But if it's later in the process, you may find you need to set it aside and say, Maybe I can choose the topic of my next research project so as to incorporate this thing. In addition to whether it's on topic, you'll want to think about what is the scope of this source? Is it too narrow or too broad? In either case, you can still probably use it, but with some limitations. Also, what level is it written at? You're not going to want an introductory overview if the paper you're writing is on a higher level than that, or vice versa. Is the intended audience appropriate for what you're doing? Again, things written for a middle school audience or a postdoctorate audience might not be at the level you need for your project. The first A is for authority, which means what can you tell about who wrote this? Do they give their name? Do they supply their credentials, which gives you some idea of what makes them qualified to speak with authority on the subject? For example, you know those best-selling fitness and nutrition books whose authors always bill themselves as doctor so-and-so? 
If you do a little checking, you'll often find that their doctorate is either honorary or in some field completely unrelated to what they're writing about, or both. Authority also incorporates the idea of accountability. So having some sort of contact information available allows you to reach the author in case there's a reason for follow-ups, clarifications, or retractions. For online resources, you can also gain some insight by examining the URL of the source. Is it legit or is it trying to fool you into thinking it's something it really isn't? If you're at some subdomain of a main site, what else is located on the same site? The second A is for accuracy, which is how well does the information presented here actually reflect the observed world? Where does the information come from? Can you independently confirm it by viewing the source or the evidence? Most people won't, of course, but making it available or saying where it comes from leaves open the possibility of checking behind the authors. Also think about how complete is the picture being presented? Are you getting just a slice of the picture? Some things are relative, and what holds true in one situation or for one slice of society may not hold true for everyone. Is that being accounted for? What does the source's use of language tell you about it? Is it making a reasoned logical argument or an appeal to emotion? Is the author exhibiting a bias, either conscious or unconscious, based on their own preconceptions or experiences? One reason your instructors may harp on about careful spelling and grammar is because there's a perceived correlation between the amount of attention paid to the mechanics of a piece of writing and the attention paid to putting its content together. So sloppy writing is associated with sloppy scholarship, and careful writing, therefore, removes that perceptual hurdle. And finally, the P is for purpose, as in, why was this created? What are the author and the publisher trying to accomplish? Everyone has an agenda of some sort or another. In many cases, the agenda is straightforward, to inform or to present reliable authoritative information. That's good. But even if the agenda has a certain amount of bias to it, say, interpreting events from a certain political or ethical perspective, if the author is upfront and clear about that bias, you, as the reader, can take that into account as you're deciding how to use the work. In any case, you'll want to make some determinations as to whether the work is factual, it's an opinion not supported by verifiable evidence, or if it's propaganda which is a skewed, partial presentation of only the facts that support the promoted view. Think about what biases the creators of the work are bringing to the table. Does the work hold true for everyone, or only if you belong to a specific religious, economic, political, or cultural cohort? This is especially recommended if you and the author share a lot of the same cohort characteristics. It can be hard to look beyond your own bubble but it's a skill worth cultivating. That's it for this section. In the next section, I'll talk to you about the hows and whys of citing information properly and avoiding plagiarism. Thanks for tuning in. And as a reminder, the librarians are available to help you, even when we're all in our own spaces. You can reach us by phone, by email, or via live chat from the library homepage. Bye for now. See you next time.